Well, good morning, everybody, and welcome to Severn. Uh, we're so glad you guys are here, as always, whether you're watching online or with us here in person. And uh, if I haven't had a chance to meet you yet, my name is David. I'm on staff here. And uh, we have a couple things coming up uh, in the next week, actually next weekend, that we want to make you aware of, uh, really just to give you different opportunities to connect, get more involved if you want to, or if you're new, we're here just to find out more about us. And uh, the first thing I wanted to let you know about is actually next Sunday um, at 7 p.m., we're actually going to have our Next Steps class. Um, and that'll actually be online class. Uh, last time we did it online, it lasted less than an hour, so it's very, uh, very easy just to just tune in to it, and um, it's really not a big commitment at all. It's low pressure, uh, but it gives you a chance to really just find out more about us as a church and how you can take your next steps, how you can really get more involved if you want to be. Uh, it's very low pressure. We don't try to force you to make decisions, but uh, we'd love to see you there, and if you're interested in being a part of that, uh, you do have to register so we can get you the link for the online class. And you can do that at severn.cc slash next steps, uh, or you can just talk to somebody with a host team shirt on. We can get you signed up as well. Um, but Reggie, what else is going on next weekend? And my name is Reggie. I'm the volunteer serve coordinator here. Uh, welcome, everyone. I'm here to talk about our monthly serve opportunity at Quarterfield Elementary School. It's our pop-up pantry. It's next Saturday, November 21st from 1030 to 1230. If you're interested in uh, participating in the pop-up pantry, you can either sign up at severn.cc slash pop-up pantry or stop one of us who has a host team shirt on and we'll help you get signed up here in person today. But that's all we got for you, and we're so glad you're here. Let's go ahead and worship together. Good morning, everyone. So good to see you. Let's all stand together as we just worship this morning and just sing out and praise God.
Sing, I search the world. I search the world. But it couldn't feel.
It's so good to be able to gather with you guys uh, in person and to those of you who are joining us online. We really, really, really wish you could be here with us, but we're glad that you're tuning in. Nonetheless, and um, if, you've been, if you've been dialing in with us or tuning in with us or joining us in person, uh, you know that for the past 18 weeks, we've been working through the book of Acts. And, and, and the book of Acts really is, it, it's, it's, it's a history of the earliest followers of Jesus. But more than a history, what it really shows us is, is an accurate picture. And this is at every bend, every story, every narrative. Everything that happens throughout the book of Acts really shows us what authentic Christianity looks like. And, and if you're here with us last week, you know that we took a look at uh, Paul's famous farewell speech to the elders at the church of Ephesus. And, and through that, what Paul was really doing is, is leaving a legacy for the church at Ephesus and also showing us a picture of the legacy uh, that, that Jesus always had intended for his church. And then from Ephesus, what we see is Paul makes his way to Jerusalem. And that's where we're going to pick up the storyline today. And we'll be working from, from Acts chapter 22. We'll take a look at verses 1 through 22. And now prior, prior to Paul making his way to Jerusalem, he's not certain what to expect or what he's going to face on his way there or even when he gets there. But he does have this really deep sense that, that whatever he faces is going to demand a ton of courage. And even, it, it even might demand his life. And here's how he puts it in Acts chapter 20, verse 22. He says, and now I am on my way to Jerusalem, bound in my spirit, not knowing what I will encounter there, except that in town after town, the Holy Spirit testifies to me that chains and afflictions are waiting for me. Now, Paul, it turns out that he wasn't wrong about any of this. And, and in fact, from here forward, it, it's almost like everywhere Paul goes, he's facing either a lynch mob or false accusations or a degree of injustice or he's being assaulted or arrested. But what's, what's tremendous about Paul is that through it all, he displays this, this amazing degree of courage. And, and I think that if, if, we, uh, if we're able to really zoom in and take a close look at how Paul handles the circumstances that he was up against, I think we can learn two things. I think first, we'll see a picture of what true courage looks like. And then secondly, I think we'll see how to develop the courage to face anything. And, and what, this, what this passage has to say about courage, really it doesn't matter whether you're a Christian or, or, or a skeptic or you're religious or irreligious or somewhere in between all that, I think that, that what this passage has to say about courage is really for anyone who's interested in developing the courage to face any situation that life might throw us. And here, here's why I believe that. And I, I, I hope you would agree with this, at least I think you'd agree with this, that there are situations in our lives, situations that each one of us are going to face that require courage. And now, even though most of those situations aren't life-threatening like Paul's circumstances were, I do think that each, how we handle those situations can threaten our quality of life, right? And if we're going to live in a way that frees us from being taken hostage by what's happening to us or around us, I think you'd agree that we need the courage to be able to face anything. And so to help us understand the kind of, the kind of courage that Paul had, I'd like, to, I'd like for us to look at his situation. And in order to do that, we actually have to go back to, to Acts chapter 21. This is when he had arrived in Jerusalem. And for the first few days that he's there, you, you would have found Paul in the temple. And um, eventually, people recognize him. Actually, a, Jew, a, a group of, of Jews from Asia recognize who Paul is. And, and prior to that, prior to Paul's return to Jerusalem, word had spread that Paul had launched this all-out hate campaign uh, against Jewish people. And so when word got out that he was back, an all-out riot erupts right there in the temple. And this, this was so ironic from my vantage point because the whole purpose for Paul being in the temple was because he was participating in a Jewish purification ritual. But that didn't stop the spread of uh, the lies or the false narrative that was floating around with regards to Paul and the way that people believed that he had launched an all-out hate campaign against Jews and that he was bringing Gentiles into the inner court of the temple, which was a place that had been exclusively reserved for Jewish men. And so if, if you or I were there that day and, and we made our way towards the inner court of the temple, we would have encountered a wall. And on that wall, we would have found a plaque. And on that plaque, we would have found an inscription. And here's what, it, here's what it would have said. No foreigner may enter within the barricade which surrounds the temple and enclosure. 
anyone who was caught doing so will have himself to blame for his ensuing death. And so even though this was an entirely false narrative floating around about Paul, Paul's put on notice for bringing Gentiles into the temple court, a crime that according to that plaque was punishable by death. And so what ensues is, is, is a riot breaks out. They drag Paul out into the street. There's violence. They're beating him. They're screaming that he be executed right, right there, right then and right there. And then all of a sudden word travels to the Roman, uh, the Roman guard, the colonel of the Roman guard, rather, a man by the name of Claudius Lysias. And so what he ends up doing, and he, he was there specifically to, to do crowd control, that in any event that anything occurred, such as what's happening right now in terms of this riot, he was on standby to round up troops and make his way to the riot. And that's exactly what he did. And so when the rioters saw him coming and they saw the Roman guard approaching the temple, the, uh, the, the violence toward Paul stopped, the beating stopped, but the rioting continued. And so they end up putting Paul in chains, and they did that for two reasons. First, they did that to protect him. But secondly, it was so chaotic and so violent, they were really trying to figure out who Paul, who Paul was, why he was in the city, and why people wanted to kill him. And so they take him into custody. And how Paul responds to these circumstances, I, I believe, shows us the, the first aspect of true courage, and it's this, that true courage gives us the ability to look beyond ourselves. And so Paul's been beaten so badly, and I think this is important to say, he's been beaten so badly that the Roman guard is literally carrying him towards the barracks. He's in shackles. He's surrounded on all sides. And so basically there's, there's no denying the fact at this point that he's either going to be arrested or he's going to be lynched. Right? And, and, and so if he looked to himself in these circumstances, that wouldn't have been enough. So Paul looks beyond himself, and he finds the courage to say something. He speaks up. And what he says is recorded in Acts 21, verse 37. Here's what it says. As he was about to be brought into the barracks, Paul said to the commander, Am I allowed to say something to you? He replied, Do you know Greek? Aren't you the Egyptian who raised the rebellion some time ago and led 4,000 assassins into the wilderness? Paul said, I'm a Jewish man from Tarsus of Cilicia, a citizen of an important city. And now I ask you, let me speak to the people. And so on a surface level, it may have looked as if the Roman guard was there to protect Paul and to maybe help by way of killing this false narrative that was circulating. But they're just as prejudiced as the mob. In fact, they think that Paul's a, a terrorist trying to hijack the city. And, and so the only way that that false narrative was going to change is if Paul had the courage to speak out. And so he looks beyond himself, and he says something to the commander, and he decides to say what he had to say initially in formal Greek. And now in Paul's day, the language that you spoke was one of the means by which people could identify who you were. Right? It showed people where you were from. It showed people your education level. It showed people your place in society. And so speaking in Greek really shifted the, the perspective on Paul. He went from being seen as a terrorist by the Roman guard to be seen as someone whose voice was worthy of being heard. And so Paul ended up really just looking beyond himself, and he found the courage to speak at a time when it would have been much easier for him to just stay silent. Because who was listening anyway? And here's what happens next. It's in Acts 21, verse 40. It says, after the commander had given permission, Paul stood on the steps, and he motioned with his hand to the people. And when there was a great hush, he addressed them in the Hebrew language. Brothers and fathers, listen now to my defense before you. And now, now Paul's approach, it, it, it's calm, it's cool, it's collected. He refers to these people as brothers and fathers, not as enemies. And it's so sensitive and it's so strategic all at the same time. And, and speaking in the Hebrew language was a strategic move for Paul, and here's why. Here's why Aramaic would have gotten the intention of a vast majority of the crowd. And this would have extended the reach of Paul's message to more people. Right? And, and, and in that it wasn't their native language, people would have had to lean in and listen a little more attentively to actually hear what Paul had to say. And it was sensitive. Choosing Aramaic was extremely sensitive because at this point in the story, uh, Jewish people had been scattered all over the world as a result of the Babylonian exile. And, and not all Jewish people had made their way back to Jerusalem to live. But most, most of them did travel there regularly to celebrate culture 
and customs. And when they did, communication was difficult simply for the fact that not all Jewish people shared the same native language. And this is where Aramaic comes into play. Because although it wasn't the native language of any specific group of Jews, it was the, the, the common language that was typically spoken when Jews gathered in Jerusalem from different linguistic heritages, all for the sake of celebrating their culture and customs. Aramaic would, allow, would have allowed diverse people to communicate with one another. And so speaking in Arama Aramaic was Paul's way of, of being sensitive to the diversity in the crowd. It honored the social and the cultural norms of the people who were there that day. And it also was just a, a cordial invitation that allowed them to listen to what he had to say. And here's, here's what happens as a result. It's recorded in Acts 22, verse 2. It says, when they heard that he was addressing them in the Hebrew language, they became even quieter. And I, I think we're, we're living in a day, in an age, or in, in, a, in a cultural moment where there's a lot of pressure being put on us to speak out about a lot of things. And, and I, I, like, believe me, I, I think it's important to speak out about injustices and the disparities that we see. But I think what's more important than just speaking out is the manner in which we speak. And Paul shows us that if we, if we can somehow look beyond ourselves and find the courage to speak out, we can do it in a way that does two things. On one hand, it, it's upholding the truth, and on the other, it's, it's not abandoning love. And so Paul, Paul isn't speaking because of social pressure here. Paul's speaking because he has the courage to speak. And that's what allowed him to speak the truth in love. It's what allowed him to communicate in a way that, that honored diversity. It's what allowed him to speak in a way that shows vulnerability because through what he says, he's going to be open and honest about who he is and what he believes even with people who oppose him and don't believe what he believes. And so on one hand, what he would have said that day or what he did say that day would have been extremely affirming if you were a Jew or from Jewish culture. And on the other hand, it would have been utterly challenging. And when it comes to Jesus, I think this is important for us to understand. Jesus doesn't really fit cleanly to any cultural paradigm or any group dynamic or any political bent. Uh, with, with every culture, there are things that Jesus will affirm and there are things that Jesus will challenge because there's no perfect group of people. And because Jesus is all truth and all love all the time. And so Paul's courage allows him to do a little more than just speak out. He's speaking the truth in love when he says what he says in verse 3. And, and, and mind you, this would have been relatively affirming if you, were, if you were a Jewish person in the crowd that day. Listen to what he says in verse 3. I'm a Jewish man born in Tarsus of Cilicia, but brought up in this city at the feet of Gamaliel, and educated according to the strict view of our patriarchal law, being zealous for God, just as all of you are today. I persecuted this way, he's talking about Christians there, I persecuted this way to the death, binding and putting both men and women in jail. So on one hand, we see Paul affirming Jewish heritage. He's showing, he's showing the crowd that he in no wise has broken from his ancestral faith. He's saying, I'm just like you. I'm all in on this belief that we need to be completely clean before God, that we need to do everything that we can to have a right, right relationship with God. I'm just as concerned as you are about how important it is that we align our lives to God's purpose and God's priorities. He's even suggesting, perhaps, that he's more vested than they are because he's actually terrorized People that didn't believe what he believed. He's actually been, he was actually commissioned to terrorize Christians. And so, so, so that would have been the, the, the easy part of the message. Because really all, all he's done up to that point is affirm what they already believe. But what he says next takes a great degree of courage. Because Paul moves from affirmation to, to starting to challenge or addressing the things that weren't easy to hear if you were Jewish. And I think that some of us, maybe right now, we're in a situation where if things are going to change, if anything is going to change, we need the courage to start addressing things. It's going to take courage to maybe have that conversation that you know you've been putting off. Because you know that, that, that when you do, th the potential of things breaking bad does exist. We need the courage to maybe have that conversation that we've been reluctant to have with the people in our lives who've hurt us. And look, those conversations might not fix 
everything, but I do believe that they'll, they'll provide an opportunity for you to begin to heal and for the people who've hurt you to begin to change. Right? Look, if, if all we ever do is spend our time affirming one another, we might feel validated, but we're never going to grow. And having the courage to speak the truth in love means affirming the things that you should affirm and challenging the things that should change. And the only way we can get, get to a place where we have the courage to do this is if we look beyond ourselves. Because you, I've been there, you've probably been there too. If we look to ourselves, we end up talking ourselves out of addressing the issues that we should address because of how we think someone will respond or what they're going to say or how our reputation might be challenged or changed or, or how awkward it might be or because who's listening anyway, nothing's ever actually going to change. But instead of doing any of that, in the face of a riot, in the face of people that were outwardly opposing him, Paul looks beyond himself and he has the courage to have the hard part of the conversation. And here's what he says. Take a look at verse 16. It says in verse 16, And now, why delay? Get up and be baptized and wash away your sins by calling on Jesus' name. Now look, in verses 6 through 15, Paul had walked them through this crazy experience that he had with Jesus that absolutely transformed his life. And what he's saying in verse 16 would have been challenging to hear because through it he's suggesting that Jesus is more important than Jewish law when it comes to a relationship with God. And what was very clear to Paul at this point in time is that Jesus' love was so inclusive that he was capable of welcoming anyone into the family of God, but he also believed, on the other hand, that it was so exclusive that everyone gets into the family of God the same way. Gentiles, Jews, Americans, Italians, African Americans, everyone gets in the same way through Jesus. And so this picture of baptism, here's what it would have showed the crowd, and here's what it shows us, that Jesus is who the Jewish law was always pointing to. That the law was only ever intended to show us even people who've given their lives to Jewish law, even people who, who maybe seemingly have it all put together, who've checked all the boxes and hit all the marks, even people who look like they're killing it in life, that Jesus literally is the only answer because he's the only one capable of truly cleansing us and welcoming us into the family of God. Look, Paul was a Pharisee. He had given his entire life to living according to the Jewish law. But when he met Jesus, everything changed. And he, he, he no longer saw the law as something that he had to exhaust his life trying to complete. He saw it as something that was only ever intended to show us two things. Firstly, how broken and lost and spiritually hopeless we are and how we're powerless to do anything to fix it. But secondly, it was intended to show us that Jesus is powerful enough to fix everything. And so the idea that a Jewish Pharisee would need to be baptized was the least affirming thing Paul could say. Because here's, here's the thing, in order to get cleansed, you've got to be humble enough to admit that you're dirty, that you can't make it on your own strength, that you have to look beyond yourself for the help that you need. And that takes courage. And for some of us, maybe we need the courage to admit that we were wrong, to admit that the things that we did hurt the people that we say we love the most, to allow the people who are closest to us to speak into our lives. Some of us might need the courage to, to, to break the, the, the toxic habits or the toxic thought cycles that we're stuck on that we know are really just challenging our quality of life. Some of us need the courage to stop allowing the shame and the guilt and the setbacks and the blame to define us. And some of us need the courage to stop believing that if we're really honest about what's going on in our lives, that people are going to turn their backs on us. Now look, Paul knows how hard it is to walk away from the things that we've allowed to define us. He knows that that takes courage. And he knows that confronting the areas of our lives that need to change takes courage. He knows that admitting that we're wrong takes courage. But he also knows that if we never develop the courage to face the things that we, we need to face 
ultimately we're just jeopardizing our own quality of life. And look, the past, the past maybe that you won't address is capable of hijacking the future that you want. And so Paul, he affirms some of the good things, but he challenges the things that need to change. But more important than that, there's something way more important than just challenging the things that need to change. Because in and of itself, that's not enough. And so to see that, we, we need to take a closer look at what Paul says in verses 3 and 16 and kind of put them together. Because if we do that, what becomes very clear is that Paul is sharing the gospel of Jesus. He's saying, you're worse off than you're, than, than you're even willing to begin admitting. But if you place your trust in Jesus, and this is, this, this is absolutely good news if we, can, if we can wrap our minds around this, that we're worse off than we're willing to admit. But if we place our trust in Jesus, we're completely loved and accepted as if we've lived a life that's absolutely and utterly honored God. And this is such a paradoxical way of looking at yourself, but it's so free because deep down, I think we know that we're not okay. What's hard is admitting that we're not okay. But because of Jesus, it's okay to not be okay. That's what Paul believed. And that's what early Christians believed. That through Jesus, we've been humbled to the dust, but we've been affirmed to the heavens. And it, it's a paradox, but it's so freeing because it offers a life-changing alternative to the despair of knowing that we're not good enough and the exhaustion of trying to prove ourselves. Look, because of Jesus, we don't have to play to either of these paradigms. Through Jesus, our ego can be completely humbled away, and our legitimate need for love and acceptance can be fully met. The gospel doesn't just, because the gospel, it really doesn't just challenge the things in our lives that needs to change. It gives us an alternative that can transform our lives. And when this becomes real to us, when the gospel of Jesus becomes real to us, we develop this joyful humility that, that allows us to admit that we're not okay. And we have the affirmation of knowing that one day everything is going to be okay. And you might be asking yourself at this point, like, well, well what, is that, what does that have to do with courage? Look, I mentioned earlier that true courage gives you the ability to look beyond yourself. Look, without humility, you're never going to look beyond yourself. And if you never look beyond yourself, you're never going to have true courage. Here's why. Because you'll be trying to handle all those hard and difficult and insurmountable situations that we face in life all with your own strength. And we might not think that, that, that courage and humility go, go hand in hand or that they're compatible. And maybe that's because the message that we, we tend to hear from our culture is, is designed to, to help us suppress our fears, not face them or acknowledge them. And it's humility it requires humility for us to even begin acknowledging that we're fearful in the first place. And so instead of facing our fears, our, our culture coaches us or encourages us to eliminate the possibility of failure. And here's how it does that. Um, and here's how this plays out in our lives. That conversation that we know we need to have, we don't have it because we're scared that it's going to end the relationship. Or it's, it, it's the same reason why some of us keep pretending and smiling through the pain and the emptiness and the anxiety because we're convinced that if we're honest about what's really going on, it's just going to ruin our reputation and people are going to turn their backs on us. It's why we, we tend to deny the personal issues that we know we need to address, that we would acknowledge as toxic in someone else's life, but we don't want to acknowledge it in ours because we're terrified that people are going to find something out about us that's going to rewrite the script about who we thought we were. And what we don't realize is that every time we, we act in this way and we suppress the fears in our lives, what we're doing is trying to develop courage by looking to ourselves. And, and, and suppressing fear, maybe you can relate to this. I don't think it ever really works the way that, it, that, the way that we wish it should. And here's why. <laughs> courage without fear, can, can we agree that that's just unreasonable? If you don't have fear, you don't need courage. I mean, come on now. Courage, and courage isn't the absence of fear. It's the ability to look beyond yourself and do the right thing even though you're afraid. That's what courage is. And suppressing your fear is so unhealthy because I think ultimately it denies our humanity. It's, it's fear that's part of being human. 
And it's unhealthy because fear is what keeps us from being unrealistic, right? It's what makes us aware of our limitations. It's what keeps us from being overinflated or overconfident. And I don't know about you, but you've, I'm sure we've all experienced someone who's overconfident or you've been in a relationship with someone who was overconfident. Overconfidence kills relationships. It kills opportunities. It kills quality of life. And I think sometimes overconfidence kills us because we're taking risks that we shouldn't take and doing things that we shouldn't do all because we feel overconfident. And even if, even if we are successful at, say, suppressing our fears for a season, I think we should at least stop and ask, is it working? Is my life improving as a result of that? And I think we all know that we can deny the things that we're scared of in our lives, but every once in a while, maybe when it's quiet, our lives get interrupted with those thoughts and those memories and those situations we've been avoiding. They all show up unannounced. And if that's not the case, let me offer you this. I think there's one thing that we face that, that everyone's a little scared of, and it's the fact that everyone we love has to face death, the fact that we ourselves have to face death. I think on some level that terrifies us. And one of the greatest mistakes I think we can make as people is assuming that, that we can eliminate fear by simply looking to ourselves. Like if we look to ourselves for all the answers, I think we're going to get two results. One is that we're going to end up being so insecure and so fearful that it's paralyzing and we'll never do the right thing. And the other is that we will we'll develop this lack of fear. And so without a healthy degree of fear... We end up doing the wrong thing because it's a healthy degree of fear that prevents us from engaging risky behavior in risky behavior. It prevents us from telling our wives that there's something out there more painful than childbirth, right? It's a healthy degree of fear that tells you not to clap back at mom when she tells you what to do or to just dial in and do what your boss asks you to do. Look, looking at ourselves never eliminates fear. It just jeopardizes our quality of life. And so courage isn't the absence of fear. It's the ability to look beyond yourself and allow fear to play an appropriate role in your life so that you can do the right thing even when you're afraid. Look, true courage, it gives us the ability to look beyond ourselves. But secondly, True courage gives us the ability to look toward something else. If we look closely at what Paul's really saying in Acts 22, what, what we'll find is that we'll find what he was looking toward. He wasn't looking, uh, he was looking beyond himself, but he was looking toward something. And Acts 22 shows us what he was looking toward. And, and Paul found this, this true courage that we're talking about today by looking away from himself, from this unique form of humility that he had. But he also learned to look towards something else from a unique form of, of hope that Paul had. And this is, this is much different than how our culture would maybe advise us to, to the ways that we would find courage. I think one way that we hear our culture telling us to find courage is through um, something that, that, that's kind of like self-esteemism. And, and, and here's, what, here's what I mean by that. You're, you're facing a difficult situation, and you psych yourself up, and you tell yourself you're good enough, and you tell yourself you're strong enough, and you tell yourself you can, and you say things like, let's do this, we got this, let's go, and then it doesn't always work out the way that we thought it would. Because we do have limitations, and we do have weaknesses, and we do have struggles, and we do have things that require help outside of ourselves. And then the other way that, that, that our culture tells us to find courage, it really dates back, it's a lot more ancient, it dates back to a man by the name of Cicero who was a, a Greco-Roman Stoic and he wrote a, a really famous treatise on, um, on the, and what he was really spelling out is, hey, you shouldn't be afraid of anything, not even death. And here's what he said, he says, courage makes light of death. For the dead are only as they were before they were born. It encounters pain by recollecting that the great pains are ended by death. Others we can usually control if, they're, uh, if they are endurable, but if not, we may serenely quit life's theater when the play has ceased to please us. So this tells us that there's no reason to be afraid of anything, not even death, because when you die, you're just gone. And that'll just be, that'll be things will be just like they were before you were born. So don't be afraid because you're going to lose it all anyway. I think there's a problem with that philosophy of life, and I think it's this. I think it's simply it's, un, it's psychologically unhealthy. 
And here's why I think that. I think to, cur- to get courage the way that Cicero is suggesting and the way that so- in some ways our, our culture suggests as well, in order to get courage that way, you got to deaden yourself to love, right? And before you believe something like that, I think you should stop long enough to ask yourself, what is it that makes our lives most meaningful? And so think about this. Is it your health that makes your life most meaningful? I think to an extent. Is it your, is it your wealth, what you have, what you possess, what you've, what you've accrued? I think to an extent, if we're honest. Is it your success? What you've achieved, what you've accomplished. And I think if we're honest, to a degree, yes. But I think there's something more, more than that. And, 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 and that comes by way of asking this question. What if you had all of those things but you didn't have love? What if you had all the success and the wealth and the health that you could dream of, but you didn't have anybody in your life to love and you had nobody that loved you back? Wouldn't that make your life kind of meaningless? I believe that what makes our lives most meaningless is having people that we love and they love us back. And if if, if I'm right, if this is what makes our lives meaningful, I think it's completely unreasonable to tell people not to be fearful of an impending reality void of the very thing that makes life meaningful, of a future that's void of, of love and the ability to love and the ability to be loved Back, I think that's unreasonable. And I think deadening our hearts to love is completely unreasonable. I think it's dangerous. I think deadening our hearts to fear is dangerous. And I think it's dangerous because in so many ways it denies our humanity. And it might work partly or for a season or short term, but I don't think deadening your heart to fear or love is going to be fulfilling. Paul didn't get courage from deadening his heart to fear, and he certainly didn't get it by deadening his heart to love. Paul got his courage from looking beyond himself and toward Jesus. Take a look at verse 8. This is Paul talking about when he met Jesus, and, and, and here's an exchange that they had. Paul, Paul gets knocked off his horse on his way to Damascus and blinded, and, uh, and he says, Who are you, Lord? And Jesus said, I am Jesus, the Nazarene, the one you are persecuting. Then he said, what should I do? And Jesus told him to get up and go into Damascus, and there you will be told about everything that is assigned to you. This was the moment that Paul realized Jesus, whom he thought was dead, was alive. And from that moment on, everything started to make sense. Paul's life started to make sense. Having a hope for the future started to make sense. And what was really clicking for Paul was this. If Jesus really died on the cross taking our punishment, and if he was really raised from the dead, when we believe in him, not only are our sins forgiven, but we now have this incredible hope for the future. We too will be raised. And everything that's wrong in our lives and in this world is going to be made right. That suffering and death will find their ultimate end in Jesus. And look, the resurrection, hear it like this, it's not just a consolation for our brokenness. What it means is complete restoration. We get it all back. All the love that we've lost, all the people that we've lost, all the good aspects of life that have been stripped away from us now, we get it all back in a new and unimaginable, unfathomable, unfathomable way to, to, in, in amazing degrees of glory, joy, and strength. Amen? And so look, it, w- it, was through, it was through Paul that Jesus finally found the hope that he was looking for. And it's a hope that, that started to redefine everything because it's a hope that does redefine everything. And it reminds us that everything we face in this life right now really is just meant to serve as an indicator that this is not the end, that the circumstances that we are facing right now are meant to be just another reminder that one day Jesus will make everything as it should be. And so the first aspect of true courage is looking beyond yourself, but the second is looking towards something else, and that something else is Jesus. Look, if you want to have the courage to face anything, to face the parts of you that you know need to change, to face the conflict in your marriage, to resolve the conflict that maybe you have with your kids, to face the people who've hurt you, 
to face that news that you, that you got and you're terrified because it's news that you never thought you would hear, to face the diagnosis that maybe you just got or that someone you care about just got, or to face ultimately even death. You have to learn to look beyond yourself. And this takes humility. And you have to, to learn to look towards something else. And that takes hope. And the only one that can give you the humility you need to look beyond yourself and your circumstances towards a future hope that can't be taken away from you is Jesus. And the only way that we can have the courage to face anything is through Jesus. And this isn't the kind of courage that comes from deadening your heart to love or deadening your heart to fear. This isn't the kind of courage that comes from bolstering your self-esteem. Bolstering your self-esteem. It comes from placing your trust in Jesus. And doing that will allow you to face anything without losing hope. I don't know if you know this about Jesus, but Jesus is the only God who has courage as one of his attributes. And Christianity really is. It's the only religion that claims to have a courageous God. And when, when God became a man through Jesus, he became vulnerable. He became human. And at the, end of the, at the end of his life, when he was in the Garden of Gethsemane, and the lynch mob was coming for him, and everyone who was supposed to support him had abandoned him, it was dark. And Jesus was alone. And the weight of what he was about to face was being completely unleashed on him. So intensely that bloody sweat was pouring from his body. What unfolded in the Garden of Gethsemane is arguably the clearest picture of cure, courage in the history of the world. And you might be asking, well, well, how can that be? Because isn't Jesus facing the cross the most brilliant picture of courage? But hear me out on this. And maybe you've never thought about it like this. Once Jesus was nailed to the cross, there was no turning back. But in the garden, there was an opportunity for Jesus to turn away. Jesus could have left. He was alone. It was dark. Gethsemane is far enough on the outskirts of Jerusalem, of the city, that he could have left. He could have broke camp and been gone and nobody would have known where to find him. And the fear was so intense that we read that Jesus even considered leaving. It's recorded in Matthew chapter 26. Here's what Jesus says. He says, my soul is overwhelmed to the point of death. My Father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. Look, what we see in Jesus in the garden is the most clear picture of courage in the history of humanity. He wasn't suppressing his fear. He wasn't deadening his heart to love. And he wasn't bolstering his self-esteem. The fear was so intense, but his love for people was so much more powerful. Fear was completely unleashed on Jesus, and Jesus faced it by looking beyond himself and toward his Father. And that's exactly what he was doing in what's recorded in Matthew 26, verse 42. It says, My Father, if it is not possible for this cup to be taken away unless I drink it, may your will be be done. Look, this is the courage of Jesus. And as we wind down today, I want to show you another place in Scripture that, that, that makes it very clear what the courage of Jesus looks like and what, what, what courage could look like in, like in our lives. And this is what Paul, later, some say that he, he wrote this. It, it's in Hebrews chapter 12, and some ascribe that to Paul. We're not really sure if he wrote it, but if he did, this is a clear picture of what Paul would have learned from Jesus. It's in Hebrews chapter 12, and here's what it says. It says, let us run with endurance the race that lies before us, keeping our eyes on Jesus, the source and perfecter of our faith. Who for the joy that lay before him endured a cross and despised the shame and has sat down at the right hand of God's throne. For consider him who endured such hostility from sinners against himself so that you won't grow weary and lose heart. Look, Jesus was able to look beyond himself and toward the joy of pleasing his father and redeeming his friends. And if we, if we can develop the ability to look beyond ourselves and toward Jesus and see him courageously loving people 
and courageously dying for us, facing the full weight of sin and death so that nothing we face in this life can have the final say in our lives, we will have the courage to face anything. Let me pray for us. Jesus, you know full well who we are and what we need. And you know full well what we struggle with and and how in and of our own strength, we're, we're really incapable at surmounting the things that, that, that we're facing perhaps today that we know we can't surmount. And God, I just pray that you would make us a people, make us a people who have the humility to admit that we need help when we face situations that demand a help that we can't give ourselves. Jesus, help us to be a people that are so acquainted with, with the courageous love that you showed on the cross, with the way that you secured through your death and through your resurrection a hope that can't be taken away from us regardless of what we face. Help us to be a people that are so acquainted with that that we become people who are capable of facing anything. Jesus, I want to pray for the people who are here today in person and online who, who maybe this week or in recent weeks got news that's, that's unbearable. It's unfathomable. It's something that they never expected. God, I pray that you would show up in a way. Show up in a way that makes yourself real. Give them the humility to admit that they need you, to cry out to you, to ask for your help. And give them the assurance that you are a God that is with us and for us and will walk with us through the, through the waters that flood our lives and through the fires that you're a God that is with us regardless of our circumstances, that you never turn your back on us, and that you're capable of doing absolutely anything, and that, that through it all, through it all, you can grow us and you can work in us a degree of faith that we didn't know we could ever have. God, I pray that you would meet people right where they are and you'd give them everything that they need so that they can face the circumstances that they're facing with the courage that, that, that only comes from you. Jesus, we love you so much, and we are so glad to be a part of your family. In your holy name, amen. So my hope is born.
that you chose to spend this time with us this morning, whether it's here in person or whether you tuned into our live stream broadcast. You know, it's, it's our hope that each and every time that we gather that you have an encounter with Almighty God, either through the worship or through the word that God spoke, especially this morning through Aaron Mayhew. You know, if that is you, if you've been touched this morning, if you found the courage that you need to go through some personal difficulty, maybe it's, it's some pain that you're feeling or even some uncertainty of what the future is going to hold, please get in touch with us. There's so many ways that you can do it. You can do it through your Connect card online or in person. You can do it by sending us a line at, uh, at severn.cc or just posting a chat to the chat room. We'd love to hear from you. We'd love to know that what we're doing here is making a difference in your lives and how we can help. We thank you, and we just look forward to seeing you next week. Have a great week. Have a great day.